Welcome to The Book Show, a celebration of reading and writers. I'm Joe Donahue. Comics and cultural superstar Alison Bechtel is back. Once again, she has reinvented memoir by telling her life story decade by decade through the lens of her lifelong obsession with exercise. In her new graphic memoir, The Secret to Superhuman Strength, Bechtel delivers a deeply layered story of her fascination from childhood to adulthood, with every fitness craze to come down the pike from Jack LaLanne in the 60s to the existential oddness of present-day spin class. But the more Bechtel tries to improve herself, the more herself appears to be the thing in her way. Alison Bechtel's cult following for her comic strip Dykes to Watch Out For expanded wildly for her best-selling memoirs Fun Home, adopted into a Tony Award-winning musical, and Are You My Mother? Her many honors include being named a MacArthur Fellow and Cartoonist Laureate of Vermont. It is a great pleasure to welcome Alison Bechtel to this week's book show. Alison, thank you very much for being with us. What a delight to have you on the program. Yeah, I'm very happy to be here. Thank you. Thanks for having me. You established this quite early in the book, and I find it fascinating because even though you have had this lifelong relationship with exercise, you do not in any way, shape, or form consider yourself to be a jock. <laughs> yes. That feels like a, a very different kind of person to me. Um, you know, jocks are people who play sports on teams and they have good social skills and they know what to do in, you know, strategically in a game. And I'm not good at any of those things. I'm much more of a solitary exerciser. You know, I do things like skiing and biking and running that I can do alone. So when you think of your relationship with exercise, and as you, you point out in the book, it, it's always been something that has been a, a part of you. When did you start to think of it? Okay, this is something that I can write about. This is something that, that has enough, uh, enough heft to it that I can, I can use this to, to write about and, and to further explore what's going on here. Well, I've been thinking about this stuff all my life. You know, as soon as I noticed as a teenager that I would have a sort of euphoric feeling when I went running sometimes, I, I became interested in that, you know, kind of altered state aspect of exercise. And as I've done different things over the years, I, you know, I've just like been keeping notes in my head. And <laughs> in a way it was something I didn't really think about much. The, the beauty of exercise for me was that it just got me out of my head and I wasn't, you know, analyzing it. But I, I did know there was something going on that I wanted to explore more intellectually. And um, so finally, I got to a point in my life where, well, maybe it was also a factor of kind of running out of stories. I'd written two family memoirs and I didn't have any like ready-made stories like that uh, on tap. And that's when I thought, okay, maybe this exercise thing, maybe it's time to do that. I mean, that's the next thing mm. I'm most passionate about or, you know, had a really clear feeling for. So that's what I wrote about. And, and yet it's so much more about so much more than that. Did that surprise you? I mean, I when I read the pitch several months ago, I thought, oh, well, that seems really fun. And then when you read the book, well, it's I mean, it's it's fun, but it's it's very deep. Yeah, I, I thought it would be a quicker, lighter project than it actually turned out to be. I thought maybe I could do this in two or three years. Uh, and it took me eight in the end, partly because... I don't know. For me, writing a book is always a process of exploration. I don't know really where I'm going when I go in. I might have, I mean, I do have a proposal that I write up, but the book always ends up being something really different from what I originally envisioned because I'm trying to figure something out. I'm trying to learn something and you don't know what that's going to be until you do it. So I always feel like I'm sort of doing a kind of high wire act as I undertake these memoirs, you know, I'm committing to doing it, but I don't know exactly where it's going to go. In that high wire act, I mean, is it like that always that you that you are one step away from falling? <laughs> it often feels like that. It's funny because one of the activities I sort of took up while I was working on this book is walking on a slack line 
uh, which is a very yeah. vivid evocation of exactly that feeling. But I, I liked walking on the slack line too, because I would have these moments of balance when everything else fell away and I was just perfectly balanced on this line. That's what I'm always trying to find in my, in my work. And I get glimpses of that in, in my exercise life. We are roughly the same age. Uh, just a, you're just a shade older, but um, but Jack Lalanne was a big deal when I was growing up, and um, apparently was when you were at your at your age too. Um, talk a little bit about that and and what your sort of relationship to to that. Because now it just seems so odd. That, because I remember just this this guy running out on the Dinah Shore show and doing like a hundred push-ups in four seconds. <laughs> well, I would see his regular show. Like if I was homesick from school and watching TV, he would be on. Yeah. And you know, he had this crazy organ music. <laughs> it was the you know it was the the mid '60s when <laughs> that was like the soundtrack to television. And he would be talking to housewives, to women who were home all day, you know, taking care of the house and raising their kids. And um, he would give them a little exercise break. And it was a new thing. You know, people didn't really exercise very much before the 1960s. It was just not really done. I feel like the course of my life has spanned this, um, you know, emergence of exercise as a phenomenon. So that was interesting to me too, just right about, you know, the course of my own life and the ways that it has overlapped with these exercise and fitness trends. You're, you're also not only looking at your, uh, your athletic pursuits, um, but also your exercise pursuits, but also of literature and finding a path of, of understanding more about yourself that, that starts very young and so you you're you're in the 60s trying to figure out Kerouac good luck <laughs> <laughs> yeah you know Kerouac's book the Dharma bombs was one thing I did sort of have at the beginning of this project I loved that book I'm not a huge Kerouac fan in general you know he's kind of a jerk kind of a you know very sad tragic figure but I loved that book, which I read in my early 30s because of um, how wonderfully he talks about hiking in the mountains with his friend, the poet Gary Snyder. Um, there was, I just really felt like I was almost on those hikes with them, you know, that kind of companionable conversation that arises only when you're walking outside with someone. So that book was sort of a, a way in. And then I, it, it led me to um, the people who inspired Kerouac, like Ralph Waldo Emerson, you know, the American transcendentalist writer. And then uh, Margaret Fuller, another transcendentalist and a friend of Emerson's. Um, you know, these people were living in down in Massachusetts in the early to mid 19th century. And they were, they were hippies, you know, those people were like totally hippies 100 <laughs> years before there was such a thing. Right. So I feel like there's this this lineage, and then going back from the transcendentalists to the people who inspired them, uh, Wordsworth and Coleridge, the, the British Romantic poets. Um, I just started feeling a kind of comradely connection to these people who were out in nature, talking about their sort of transcendent experiences in nature, and trying to make sense of it all. Alison Bechtel is our guest on this week's book show. The name of the book is The Secret to Superhuman Strength. What is it, do you think, about uh, there are so many ex exercise fads. I mean, one of the things that, that really is fascinating in this book, too, as just a side note, is how many of these things come and go. Uh, you try many of them, and we learn about them or, or we're reminded of them in the book. What do you think it says about exercise that we always sort of need that next thing? Well, I mean, that's sort of an aspect of human nature in general. We, we like novelty. There's some evolutionary reason for it, which I can't think of right now. But with exercise, you know, exercise is often kind of uncomfortable or painful. And so I think finding ways to trick ourselves into it, like with 
a new routine or a new piece of gear, I think feel like that's kind of legitimate. I don't feel bad about all the things I've tried and quit. I feel kind of glad I tried them. But there are certainly fads within it, which are, are fascinating in and of themselves. You write quite a bit just about athletic clothing, and you're trying to figure that out. Yes. Um, and this is another thing that has happened over the course of my life. The You know, this birth of this whole industry of outdoor gear, you know, not just backpacking equipment, but the clothing that goes with it, which I've always just, you know, I... I love practical, comfortable clothing. And, you know, like I discovered Patagonia stuff in in the 1980s when that started getting me. Oh, and before that, I discovered L.L. Bean. That was my yes. gateway drug. Um, <laughs> I you love know, your I, cartoon depictions of the old L.L. Bean catalogs. They're great. Yeah, yeah. So, no, I just love, you know, I'm a Vermont lesbian. I just love comfortable clothing. <laughs> and... I love how clothes just get more and more comfortable, especially during the pandemic. I don't think I've had actual pants on for over a year. I'm just always wearing these kind of, you know, fleece leggings or some kind of sports gear all day long. When you started out on, uh, in the story, and, and because it is your story, do you know, and you were talking about this tightrope early on, but how how present was the ending of how you were going to conclude this at the beginning of the project? You know, endings are very difficult for me, especially when I'm writing a memoir. How do you end right. a memoir about your actual life? Um, in this case, I brought it up to pretty much the moment at which I finished the book, but I didn't know for a long time how that was going to happen. And I wasn't even sure for a long time what exactly the book was about. And it's very hard to finish a book when you're not sure what it's about. But I did have a, an insight as I got toward the end of this last decade. I think I was about six years into the project. I had a realization one day when I was out running, actually, that I could end this book with this moment that had just happened to me when I had just like, on my run, I took a little detour and visited a a waterfall that sometimes is flowing near my house. And I just had this very kind of mystical moment there at the waterfall, realizing that, you know, my life is going to end. So let's get this book done <laughs> and you can end it right now. And I can't explain this. It did take me two more years to finish the book, but somehow <laughs> that's still the, the moment at which the book sort of completes itself. Well, the way since you have these nice round numbers of, of being born, so you, you have the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, and that's how the, the, the book is, is set up uh, by these these 10 years each decade. You bring us up to that to that point, of course, at the end, so it's that natural conclusion of, of the end of your 59th year. And then the, the last year, 2020, just blew up. You have the election, you have the pandemic, you have the George Floyd protest. Did it have an impact on on how you looked at the whole project and how you were going to end it? It did. You know, I had a very interesting pandemic experience because I was in the thick of drawing the book. Um, I, I had a deadline of the end of last year to finish all this work. And so I was just drawing, drawing very intensely and working with my partner, Holly, who colored the book with me, we were actually experiencing, experiencing a kind of flow state in this work that made all the rest of the world kind of fall away. I knew that everything was in upheaval, this, you know, all these terrible and revolutionary things were going on, but I felt quite calm and focused on what I was doing, which was a really nice feeling. I don't mean to say I was disengaged from what was happening in the world, but it didn't uh, throw me. I felt like I, I was actually like living out my the goal of this book, the, the goal I had hoped for, which is to um, kind of get outside of myself and just be caught up in what I'm doing. So that was a really nice feeling. 
in in what we were just talking about when I asked you the question initially, are are you used to talking about yourself? Like, are are you <laughs> has that become easier for you and and more understanding? Because you put so much into your work, and then everything explodes for your career, and and people know you, and and so many more people want to talk to you about your work. Was that was that something you had to do to adjust to? Thank you for asking that question. <laughs> yes, it was, and it is something I'm continuing to have to adjust to. I I feel like I I do try very much to be honest and forthcoming and to divulge real stuff about my life. Um, but then I have to go out and talk about it, and people always seem to want to know more, <laughs> more more personal stuff. You know, I think what's happening right now, I've been just been doing a lot of interviews and publicity for, for this new book. And I feel like in a way, the book is about like getting beyond my own ego, you know, transcending my individual self. And now I'm being forced to talk like constantly about myself. <laughs> so I'm having a sort of whiplash, you know, I'm, uh, I mean, that's the nature of the ego. You, you can't escape it. it it's always coming back. Uh, mm. So I'm just sort of trying to navigate that right now. Given the beautiful work that you did in the first two books, but but then Fun Home just takes off and, and becomes a Tony Award-winning musical. And so does that, I mean, obviously the success is great, but it's, it's your life that everyone is, is relating to. And how do you compartmentalize that? Um, I'm not sure. I'm just constantly trying to figure that out. I love writing memoir. I love writing about the actual stuff of my life. Um, it's, it's a very odd feeling having just a higher profile and knowing that a lot of people are, you know, looking at what I'm doing, that wasn't the case when I wrote Fun Home. I felt, you know, completely free and unobserved as I was writing that book. So I guess the goal now is to, you know, try to continue feeling that way, even though it's not really the case, even though I am being more scrutinized. I think it's possible to just kind of get myself in a mindset where I can let, you know, forget about all that and just try to do what I do. Does exercise help that in the sense of removing yourself yes. from the other world that you live? Yes, absolutely. That's one of the things that I love so much about exercise. You know, after doing an interview like this, I'll go for a run and I'll, <laughs> my equilibrium will be restored. Not that this is an unpleasant experience. <laughs> yeah, sorry, I'm screwing up your <laughs> equilibrium. But, I, you know, I'm a very, by nature, a, a very solitary introverted right. person and it drains me to do do a lot of public stuff i get energized by exercising when it comes to the exercise do you feel what what is your relationship with goals when it comes to exercising i am much more lenient as i've gotten older than i used to be i used to push myself a lot harder you know i'd i'd go out on a hike even if i was tired uh i'd I'd push myself to ride a certain distance on my bike. I'm much less likely to do that now, partly because I just don't have that same kind of energy and partly because I've learned that, you know, that's counterproductive. The point of doing stuff is because it's pleasant and fun, not to torture yourself, not to suffer. Alison Bechtel is our guest on this week's book show. The name of the book is The Secret to Superhuman Strength. When you think of the the various things that you that you write about and go through in the book and you talked about this being a multi-year project and so it it ebbs and flows there it it takes shapes and and i assume there's there's times of great frustration and times of great excitement um in the story of the book uh, yes and and in, in your yeah. telling of it yeah, I mean, I, I'm basically at, attempting to tell the whole story of my life uh, through this lens of right. exercise. That's how I narrowed it down. Like, you can't really tell the story of your life, or it would be a thousand volumes long. 
Um, so, you know, I, as I looked back over the course of my life, I, I've always kept a diary. I have this like endless record of my own life. And I was looking at that as I wrote the book and starting to see patterns like what else was going on in my life when I was studying karate in my early 20s? And I started seeing these ways that my creative life was connected to something that was going on with my athletic life. So those patterns started emerging. And then also I would see, you know, periods of my life when I was stuck or having difficulties. Um, I would sort of map out specific moments in my life that felt important to this larger narrative moments of some kind of realization moments of some kind of loss that you know sparked a, a new kind of awareness you know those big moments in your life i tried to like find those and um draw them you know often those moments are drawn as a as a splash page a right. big image bleeding off the page or um some of them are done in not in color and pen and ink uh, the way most of the book is drawn but in black and white brush drawings um, to sort of convey something more m mystical about these these kinds of moments moments where, where there's some kind of breakthrough that i experience there there are two pursuits here if if I, at least in, in, in my mind, there are, of telling the story and the art. And I, I assume, obviously, they, they, they merge together and are, are one, but that, as you say, even if you're doing a page and you're doing a splash, I mean, that, that is, is very time-consuming, I would assume, to work on that. And then to get the text right, it's, it's, it's a, it's a balance constantly, wouldn't it be? It is. It's a it's a really strange process that I feel like I'm just constantly inventing as I go along. But I, yeah, the drawing is quite labor intensive, so I don't like to do a lot of that until I've got the story really mapped out. I write in a drawing program, which means that I'm on the computer and I'm typing, but I'm working on a page where. I, I have my panels laid out. I'm creating little boxes of text and little speech balloons. So I'm already conceiving of the page visually. And I know I have some sense of what the ultimate drawings there are going to be. I'm just not actually making them yet. So I spend a lot of time on that writing process and getting figuring out where the book is going. And it's not until it's finished, the whole thing is finished, that I start printing those pages out and actually doing the whole process of sketching and penciling and inking that results in the final drawings. The color in the book is beautiful, and the, the art itself is is beautiful. And, and sometimes you get so caught up in the story, you forget and to look. And, and I had to remind myself a couple times to go back and, and just enjoy every panel the the art is lovely oh thank you i i haven't ever done a full color book before uh, i was kind of daunted by that prospect because color is just hard you've got you know, you've got to color every square inch of the story i ended up actually not having time to do that my partner holly holly taylor is a an artist and was able to step in and help me with this project. She was so generous. It was this huge project of basically, you know, uh, doing a thousand little paintings. And but even more than that, it was complicated because she wasn't working in color. I came up with this crazy technique where she was actually painting in gray ink on different layer on a cyan layer, a magenta layer, a yellow layer for each page. Don't even don't ask why it's too okay. geeky, geeky and complicated. But <laughs> Um, <laughs> she, she was incredibly generous and I, I, I'm very happy with the way these drawings came out. You would never know that they were done completely in gray. And that I assume by just by the, the idea of the way you're doing it, that, that there's a transformation then to see what you had initially conceived to what it becomes that, that must just burst into life. 
Oh, yeah. It was always a, a exciting reveal when we'd get everything scanned into Photoshop and do this tinting so the gray layers turn into the colors and then it all comes together. It's, it's, it's really, it was magical. As we sit here and, and we talk about this project, I, do you think of of projects ahead or is it just, no, I, I, I have to wait till that comes and I, I'm good with this until something else arrives? Um, no, I always feel like I'm ready to just get going on the next project. I And I will as soon as I have a spare moment. I I feel like with every book that I write, I end up with some leftover material that mm. <laughs> is the seed of the next one. There's a lot of stuff I didn't get to in this book that's just waiting to be given some kind of shape. I'm not sure what my ideas about it are very vague, but I, I know very much that I'm going to embark on a, another book very soon. And it will be about you. It'll be a memoir. <laughs> yeah, I'm afraid it will be, Joe. I, it seems to be uh, all I'm capable of writing about. <laughs> but isn't it handy that we like you? <laughs> I hope I remain likable and don't go through some kind of unpleasant transformation. <laughs> uh, and and that, that we find you, the audiences find you fascinating and want to and want to read. I mean, this this book is just so immersive in that sense and and is so emotional and beautiful and and funny and that that's what it's supposed to be, but I can't imagine the toll it takes on you to get there. Well, what else would I be doing, you know? <laughs> it keeps me off the streets. <laughs> the name of the book is The Secret to Superhuman Strength. Alison Bechtel is the author. Alison, thank you so much for being with us. What a great pleasure to have you on the program. Thank you, Joe. It was really fun. I appreciate you it. Will. Thanks. Alison Bechtel's new book is The Secret to Superhuman Strength. It is published by Houghton Mifflin Harcourt. We enjoy hearing from our listeners about our shows. You can email us at book at wamc.org. You can listen again to this or find past book shows via podcast or at wamc.org. Sarah LaDuke produces our program. Bookmark us for next weekend. Thanks for listening for The Book Show. I'm Joe Donahue.